Hey everyone and welcome to another video. I am Simply G and today I'm going to be going over my January to March wrap up a video for Manga Hoarders 2019 Manga Reading Challenge. If you're not familiar with this challenge, this is a yearly challenge put out by the wonderful Manga Hoarder here on YouTube, Laura, where she puts out 52 different prompts uh, and different categories of manga for you to read throughout the year, as well as five little extra hard bonuses um, to fulfill as well. Because you do have the entire year to complete this, it obviously gives you a lot of flexibility and you can sort of complete it at your own pace. For me, because I had a huge amount of free time over January and February, I actually managed to read a lot more than I expected to. So I've actually filled in over half of these uh, prompts or half of these categories, which would not have been possible if not for m the wonderful access I have to a l local library with a lot of manga, as well as new digital releases, um, thanks to like Manga Plus and Crunchyroll and the Shonen Jump app, as well as um, Kodansha and their Humble Bundles they have every so often. So in this video, you will see me talking about a lot of digital manga. Uh, so just a fair warning for that, but I hope you guys enjoy. I have, as I said, filled out a lot of these these uh, categories already. And w if you are uh, also doing this, this challenge throughout the year, uh, it's really, really simple. There's not any huge rules aside from one. So with this, you can read as many volumes as you want, or as little, you can have a single volume um, apply to multiple categories or various number volumes from the same series doing the same thing or whatever you want to do. Um, for me, I like to make it a little bit harder on myself. So I stick to one series per category and no crossover. So if I've mentioned a series already, it means that I haven't applied this to anywhere else in this list of categories. I also have tried to stick to series that I started this year. So no ongoing series for me, aside from one big exception, and I will mention that when I get to it. Um, so yes, there's a lot to get through. I will warn you ahead of time that this is going to be a long video. <laughs> So apologies for that, but I hope you guys enjoy and I'll just get straight into it. First uh, category I completed was number two, which is a horror manga. And my read for this category is I Am A Hero by Kengo Hanazawa. This is the omnibus collecting the first two volumes released in English by Dark Horse. Um, it is a 22 volume long series and I believe the final volume is coming out in English in December of this year. So if you are following this series already, you should be seeing the end sooner rather than later. I chose this series because if you're not familiar with what this manga is about, it is a zombie manga about a 35 year old mangaka who's sort of very washed up. He's working as an assistant. He's never had a real huge hit. And um, this is unlike a lot of zombie manga because our main character, he's not really like the badass type. Um, he, It's interesting because it's very obvious that he suffers from sort of mental illness, a lot of very vivid delusions. So as an audience, uh, you're really not sure whether or not what he's seeing is actually happening or if it's just sort of going on in his head. Later on in this volume, you do sort of realize that, yes, these things are actually occurring, but it does build up this level of tension and dread of not being able to trust your, your protagonist and your point of view. Uh, because obviously there's a very unreliable narrator here. This series is one that I'd wanted to try for a long time. People have said very, very good things about it. It's very unlike a lot of other zombie manga insofar as the protagonist, as I've already mentioned, 
um, but just sort of the way that it's set up and how it builds to its point is fairly different. It's reminiscent of other zombie media, but not so much zombie manga that I've noticed. Um, and this is just my perception from this first omnibus. I haven't read any more than this, but I do hope to, um, if just through my library. This isn't a series that I can see myself wanting to collect and to own within the collection, but it is very, very good if you like sort of horror and zombie themed series. Um, I really enjoyed this manga after I sort of realized the direction it was taking and although as I said our protagonist is very unreliable and sort of unusual and just a, kind of a weird guy you can still see like what is appealing about him in just a general sense and why and and how also he like reacts to this situation despite his his troubles with his delusions and his mental illness he he still does have like a sense of responsibility he still knows like what's good and bad and he doesn't take this thing like super lightly he doesn't jump at the fact that you know this is his time to shine he's kind of a coward it's really a interesting and refreshing dynamic in regards to zombie protagonists or zo zombie story protagonists. Although he has like a gun and can use it, which is very unusual within Japan, he isn't like immediately this badass who's like smashing these zombies and killing them and you know all of these things. He's he's panicking. He can't trust himself, he doesn't really know what's going on, he can't fully accept what he's seeing. It's really, as an audience or as a reader, you can feel this panic building up in yourself as well, which is why it's very effective. I don't know as to how this story continues to develop from here, but I think that if you are wanting something very different and very refreshing in this genre, this is one to check out. Again, whether that be through your library or if you're pretty confident about it, then I can say it's, it's definitely one to look out for and buy if you wish. Um, really happy that I gave this series a shot and that my library actually had this available for me to read because I had wanted to read it for a long time. It has a lot of positive word of mouth. So yes, um, that was my choice for number two, being a horror manga, and I think for obvious reasons. If you like zombie stories, if you like um, interesting protagonists, if you like pretty realistic uh, depictions of these sort of crises, uh, crises, then I would definitely recommend I Am A Hero. Three is a comedy manga, um, and for this challenge, I read Junji Ito's Cat Diary, Yon and Mu, um, obviously written by the incredibly popular and famous horror mangaka Junji Ito. This is a very short little book released in English by Kodansha, and is a comedy sort of, I guess, memoir about Ito and his his wife and the cats that she brought into their family. Uh, it's very funny, he sort of prefaces this story by saying he's not really a cat person, uh, he much preferred dogs, but over the course of this short little book you really see him grow very attached to these animals and loving them just as much as, you know, his wife or his fiance does. It's it is a comedy manga. I think it works very, very well because obviously Junji Ito is a horror mangaka. He has a very distinct style. And um, because of that, I think his style works very well for the type of comedy he's portraying here. Uh, he, he definitely shows off sort of the ridiculousness of being a pet owner, regardless of what kind of pet that is, but cats in particular have always had this sort of weird eeriness to them, sometimes a stigma amongst certain people, but they can act just very weirdly, and... <laughs> 
even as a cat owner, you can recognize like, why are you, so, why do you act so weird? What, what do you want? Like you get, it, it is this like really weird relationship that you have with a, with a cat, but at the same time, you still love them and you sort of forgive them a lot of their weirdness and a lot of their creepiness, which out of context is very unnerving. And for people who aren't familiar with cats, they can very much like be like, how do you put up with that? Oh, your cat looks weird. And Ito says, uh, especially with Yon, the white one, um, he's, he's not really a lovable looking cat. He's very creepy looking and weird and he does a lot of weird stuff. But that in, its, in itself is why this cat is so charming and why he does sort of become so lovable and why Iho attaches himself to both of these cats. It's really, really well done. It's very funny. I'm not uh, currently a cat owner. My family did have a cat when I was much younger. Um, but I haven't really spent a huge amount of time around cats. That being said, I don't dislike cats. I think they're wonderful, especially, you know, like with people, they, they have their personalities. Um, and like with any other pet, if they're looked after, they're wonderful creatures. Um, but even, even saying that, like, I'm not a cat owner, but I can still see a lot of the humor in this series. And a lot of the sentiment is similar regardless of pet, like what kind of pet you have. Uh, dogs, rodents, birds, fish, reptiles especially. There are some things that people just don't understand, but humans, we attach ourselves and we attach a lot of uh, emotional sensitivity to our animals. And animals are wonderful, be do all animals, but domesticated animals especially, because they do have this sense of like reciprocated love. Um, a lot of people say that dogs are like unconditional love. Cats are very much conditional love, but that's not to say that they don't care about their owners and they don't care about the people in their house. They certainly usually think they're, uh, you know, smarter than everyone else in the house, but that doesn't mean they don't value you. And a lot of the time they do try their best to look after us because they realize, oh, this idiot can't hunt. I have to go catch at something. And it's frustrating for us and it, it's gross, but, you know, that's how they show their love. And it's about understanding, like, what they're doing to show affection comparatively to like how obviously humans process process those same things and and the I guess frustrations of them but yes Yon and Moo is a fun little series it's super duper short though and I think it's fairly normal priced which is why I didn't want to buy it myself you may have noticed in watching, uh, you know, longer videos of my or collection videos of mine, that I don't actually own any Junji Ito works. I have read uh, a couple of his stories, Uzumaki, Gyo, um, something else as well, I can't remember right now. And, and I do respect him a lot as a creator. I think he's obviously had a huge amount of influence within the horror manga community. He, but he's not my favorite horror mangaka and a lot of his stuff, um, they're very eerie and creepy, but they're not necessarily as horrifying to me as maybe some other things, other horror manga are, which is why I haven't really commit myself to buying any of his stuff. I do want to get, um, maybe one or two of his titles, but it's not a high priority. That being said, that's why I didn't want to go out and buy this book for myself, but if you are a Junji Ito fan, it's a great little edition, but maybe get it on sale because it is a lot of money for like the amount of pages. If you're a cat fan or cat lover, this is definitely a book that will probably appeal to you. The comedy is very, very good. 
Um, or even if you're just like a pet owner in general, I think just because it's about cats doesn't mean it's only applicable to cats. Um, but yeah, it is a fun little book and obviously my choice for comedy and yeah, I'm glad that I was able to give this little thing a shot thanks to my library. Prompt number four is a romance manga and my choice for this is the currently ongoing Kaito Shonen Romance Blue Flag which is available on Manga Plus. The first volume worth of chapters is available and then it skips about 20 and is currently up to date with uh, I think chapter 42 being the most recent one. This is a phenomenal series. I highly encourage people to read it. I'm not always a huge fan of shonen romance because I find a lot of them to be very reliant on fan service. I find a lot of the relationships to be fairly shallow. Um, this is not that. This is a series that I had heard very good things about for a very, very, very long time. And I, even saying that, I didn't, hadn't really heard any, like, reasons as to why it was very good. It does have a print release in Spain, um, and people were really wanting to see it in English. And having read it, um... I now understand why. I don't want to really give a concrete answer as to, or a concrete explanation as to why because I do think the experience of reading it yourself is very important. Um, the first volume series of the series, the first eight or nine chapters, whatever it is, um, is the, f the full chapters of the first volume and it ends with a revelation, um, a reveal that uh, I think people, some people may notice coming, but it's really nice to have it, this certain aspect being treated seriously um, and being very frank and upfront about it. It's really, really good. This series is about a bunch of high school kids in their final year, um, two childhood friends, best friends, and the girl sort of in addition who... Uh, one of these boys likes, she has feelings for the other boy, and she has a best friend as well, and it's sort of the messy relationships um, and the growing up in love lives that teens go through. It is phenomenal. Um, if you like series like That Blue Sky Feeling, this that may give you a, a hint as to what this series is um, sort of it does differently. Uh, than a lot of shonen romance and I really have to credit Kaito for how wonderfully they write characters. I think the main character, this guy here, is so wonderfully relatable. His, his character arc is so interesting and it's just so so well done. Um, I, as I said the middle chapters are not available I, however I am up to date. That's I you know it's up to you whether or not that's something that is an issue, but it's it's one that now being up to date with, I can wholeheartedly say is one that I do hope we see um, a, a physical release for. It's beautiful, it's heartbreaking. The most recent volume or vo most recent chapters have absolutely broken my heart in ways that I never expected when I started this series. Um, it also reminds me a lot of like Our Dreams at Dusk, Shimononi Tasagare, so again that may give you an idea as to what this series may actually be about. Um, and I really appreciate how Kaito is able to balance all these characters and p place importance on every single one of them and treat them the same, with the same levity. And being a high school romance series, there is a lot of tropes that it could fall into, and it never does, um, or at least not to an egregious amount. It This is a fantastic series, and I highly recommend it to fans of the genre, and if you're looking for something very good on Manga Plus on this platform, 
I would definitely uh, encourage you to read this. This is not the only Kaito manga that I have read for this last three months and both of them really surprised me and I'm quickly becoming a fan of theirs. <laughs> the last one, um, Blue Flag is my choice for the letter B for the extra challenges. Anyway, number six is a historical manga. This is another digital manga and my choice for this is uh, Harold Sakuishi's Seven Shakespeare's. This is an ongoing historical fiction about the incredibly influential and well-known and famous playwright William Shakespeare. I always find it very interesting that despite being one of probably the most iconic um, writers, playwrights, um, creators within the Western world, and influencer on language and and sort of style. We really don't know a huge amount about Shakespeare. He's a very um, mysterious figure. We don't even really know if he was a singular person or whether that was more so a pen name for a multitude of people. Um, we don't really know where he's from, how long he lived. Uh, even if he was a man, frankly, like there's, there are definite theories and there's definite evidence, obviously, to say that there was an individual named William Shakespeare, but we don't really have much tangible evidence aside from his work. Um, this is obviously a fictionalized retelling of his life. A lot of the common theories and accepted truths of Shakespeare are incorporated in this this manga, but it is uh, definitely a fiction. There are certain things that I highly doubt <laughs> are accurate, um, but it is wonderful. I really enjoy this series a lot. I didn't really know what to expect going into it, but I am a fan of historical fiction. And this did not disappoint. You may know Harold Sakuishi from his other, probably more famous work, Beck, Mongolian Chop Squad, which is about a band in Japan and sort of their struggles to make it big. This is completely different setting, completely different type of series. But if you like historical fiction, if you like uh, William Shakespeare, if you like this period of history, then I would absolutely encourage you to read this. It is available via Comixology, I believe, also Kindle as well. Um, I read it via Comixology and it is fabulous. The first three volumes are two-in-one omnibus editions. The subsequent six volumes are single editions of actually the sequel, although they're all just released under the Seven Shakespeare moniker. Um, yeah, really, really good, really creative and interesting and a, a fun twist on the Shakespeare mythos almost. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, he's certainly a figure that I think everyone recognizes, everyone knows, but, uh, like historically records wise, He's definitely a bit of a question mark, and I find that fascinating, that someone who is so intrinsic to sort of Western culture and arts, we really don't know a huge amount about. But yes, Seven Shakespeare's, this is also my choice for the letter S for the bonus manga challenge, alphabet one, number three. Um, but yes, this is this is a great series that I think not a lot of people know about um, or have heard about or have tried, uh, especially compared to Beck, which definitely has a, a much more of a popular, broad appeal. It has an anime that's very popular as well. This one, if you like Beck, um, check this one out, although they are completely different. Number seven, or no, number eight, is a, a sports manga, and my choice for this is the ongoing Manga Plus title. It's a shonen sports series by Sai Yamagishi called Moonland. This is a gymnastics manga about middle schoolers. Uh, our main character, interestingly enough for a shonen sports manga, really doesn't care about being the best in Japan or winning competitions or, you know, being the best there ever was. 
his focus is being able to control his body perfectly and having the perfect relationship with how he's able to move his limbs and so his focus is on getting sort of perfect execution scores he doesn't push uh, really the the difficulty of his moves or anything like that and then we also have a rival character who is an incredibly accomplished gymnast who does some incredibly difficult stunts um, but because of that his basics and his um, you know more fundamental building block moves don't have the perfect sort of execution that this other boy focuses on. I really really like the dynamic of the characters. We have sort of like with Haikyuu we have characters who sort of start off or as introduced as rivals but at the same time become teammates later on in the series rather than just keeping them rivals at separate schools uh, as most shonen manga or sports manga do. This is a really, really wonderful read. It's only 10 chapters or so long, so it's not a huge commitment. It's still ongoing. And if you like sort of less um, conventional sports series, I would definitely recommend this one. Gymnastics is something that I have great respect for although gymnasts sort of scare me <laughs> I'm just like oh my god how can you do that that's incredible um intimidate me not scare me I think that's a better word for it um but yeah this is a fantastic series the artwork is fairly uh you can see a little bit here like it's not the best but it is very um, good. It's it's certainly not the worst thing I've ever seen, but I wouldn't say like go into it for the artwork. But in saying that, it reminds me a lot of Welcome to the Ballroom, and it captures the exertion of the sport very well. Um, you can really feel the power of these gymnasts throughout through the artwork and through the paneling. It's just done in a really interesting way and this was one of the first series that I tried on uh, Manga Plus and it has just been great. I have not been disappointed yet, although as I said it is early days, although I don't think it'll disappoint me frankly. This is number 9, a foodie manga, also this is my choice for the letter D for the bonus challenges. And I'm going to be showing off the digital version of this, but excitingly, um, and I, th I think maybe people can guess what this is now, um, this has actually been announced for a print release from Kodansha, so if you are someone who prefers physical manga over digital, then wait till that. I will see that the first volume before the end of the year, but currently this is a series that I am following on uh, a, I've, I started it via the Kodansha Humble Bundle uh, deal that they had most recently, and I'm up to date with it via the Crunchyroll app, so there's a lot of different ways you can read this manga, and it's really, really great. But this is Drifting Dragons by Taku Kuwabara. This is a fantasy uh, drama, I guess, action manga with a food spin, um, unlike Delicious and Dungeon, it's not really a comedy or anything. It has comedic elements, but I don't think that's really the focus of it. This series, I really love how the dragon design is so organic and so unlike anything I've ever seen with dragons before in fantasy. The story has a grandness to it, if that makes sense. It follows a group, an airship, of, I guess dragon slayers would probably be the proper term for them, uh, who go out and basically work as sort of mercenary groups protecting towns from dragons. They, they hunt them and then usually slaughter them and then sell off the various parts of the dragon, things like their oil and their scales and whatever else. And it's the meat that obviously they eat, they prepare, um, and it, it's done in such a reverent way, like with Golden Kamui, where it's almost an act of respect towards the animal 
um, insofar as we've hunted you and we are going to use every part of you to the best of that we can in order to you know respect and to honor the life that we've taken and this is such it's sort of reminiscent of a lot of uh, 19th century works or 20th century works about whaling and this idea of following these grand creatures that are so much more powerful than you know humanity and uh, just being in awe of the sheer sight of them, the sheer thought and experience of being out there with this animal. Um, obviously, I do not, I don't condone really hunting aside from population control at all, but I can, I can understand that this overwhelming connection, like feeling of connection with the world around you and the circle of life type feeling that in this manga that is definitely emphasized this character on the front here that we have his he is definitely the one most motivated by like eating dragons but he does it in the sense of being a larger part of this cycle of life and uh, surviving and coexisting with these creatures uh, you know if he was not eating the dragons then the dragons would definitely be eating him and he accepts that as like a very real possibility and a very real part of life and just sort of how life is it's really really well done I encourage you to try this manga if not now then when the first volume comes out it's beautifully done it's one that i wanted to start for a long time but the first three volumes worth of chapters were not available on crunchyroll so i just never got around to it and then when this series was included with the kodansha humble bundle the most recent one i jumped right into it it was the first one that i started and i caught up with the chapters immediately because it engaged me that much and it is beautiful the all of the characters all of the crew members i guess on this airship are really interesting and wonderful to read they have a bunch of different motivations and you can really feel the camaraderie the family of of these people and how they've experienced certain things together it's just so well done if you enjoy things like um the castle in the sky film it reminds me a lot of um, yeah, just this, this feeling of almost grand adventure, um, with this element of, like, dragons and hunting and, and that as well. So, wonderful series, cannot wait until the first volume comes out in print, and I hope you guys check it out too. Number 13 is a hyped manga, and my choice for this is a definitely hyped manga, one of probably the most hyped manga currently, thanks to its anime adaptation and how um, beloved, I guess, this series is within the Shonen community and Shonen Jump fans, and that is The Promised Neverland. This is an ongoing, I guess, action thriller about a bunch of orphans who realize or discover that their their peaceful life in the orphanage is not what it seems they're actually being farmed by devils or demons for their brains and then they stage an escape and are trying to you know survive and not be eaten um i can definitely see why this series is so popular um, it's, it's very different to current Shonen Jump titles. Uh, it does remind me of why things like, uh, Death Note were so popular insofar as, even though there's action elements to it, it's m very much a mental game type of thing. It, it focuses on planning and on the character's wits rather than just having the, you know, goofy, dumb, lovable protagonist. It also does have, our main character is, is a young girl, which is really nice to see in a Shonen Jump series. Um, and all of the characters are very well done, especially the, the main three. Uh, I was always wanting to read this series. I actually, I'm sort of cheating. This is one of the exceptions on this list. I read the first volume, this time last year, in fact, um, when... 
I think Viz had the first seven chapters, so the first volume worth of chapters on their website for free to encourage people to read it, to try it, and hopefully to buy it. I read it, I enjoyed it, um, but I wasn't so, like, sort of blown away by it. Um, I don't know whether it's just my sort of what I'm used to within media or whether the fact that I'm an adult reading comics for children. Um, but I was, I've never been like actually surprised or uh, anything by the series. I find a lot of it fairly standard for the genre. It's done well. Like, I'm not criticizing it for that, but I don't find anything really unpredictable. I've guessed pretty much everything that they've tried to to pull, and again, I don't know whether that's just a me thing or if that's just a, the joys of being an adult um, whilst reading media for children. And again, that's not to discredit this series. I think it does what it intends to incredibly well. It's still really engaging. I've read, as you can see, 123 of the current chapters, so I'm almost up to date. Uh, and I read it within probably two or three days, so I liked it, but it's, I knew that, I knew going into it that it wasn't a series I was probably ever going to buy, so I didn't want to invest money into it. Like, I knew that it wouldn't be a series that I like in my collection, that I wouldn't want to reread, and it's not something that really changed my life, but it is something that I had wanted to read. So the fact that Shonen Jump now has it in its entirety available just made it really, really easy for me to catch up and enjoy it just as much as it, I guess everyone else is. Like with all hyped manga, I, I definitely think there's an element as to why people love it and why it is so hyped up, and I can see that, but for me this is not like my favorite Shonen Jump titles, even, um, you know, even with currently releasing series, I think there's other stuff that Shonen Jump is putting out um, currently, so yeah, no, it's that, again, personal preference, but it's hyped, and I think it's hyped for a good reason. It's very good, very strong. Um, the Promised Neverland is one that I'm sure everyone here watching has at least heard of, if not read. If you are wanting to read it, but you're like me and don't want to buy it necessarily, um, check it out on the Shonen Jump app because it has all the 100 plus chapters there. You can start from the beginning for, what, is it like $1.99 per month? And as I said, I read it in like two days, so I'm sure you guys can read it fairly quickly too. You don't need the whole month to get through it unless you're incredibly busy, like uh, some people should be. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good series, and um, I'm glad that I read it, and I'm glad that I'm reading it. I hope to finish it, especially when it's, once it's ended. Um, but yeah, this is my choice for a hyped manga, and I hopefully you guys can agree as to why I decided on this one. Number 14 is a Gekiga or alternative manga, and the one that I wrote... wrote? read this first uh, couple months was An Imitation from a Crab by Pan Pania. This is an alternative manga sort of exploring this young woman's area and her day-to-day -day life, but seeing sort of uh, the extremely unusual within the mundane. And I, it, it's an interesting one because it is generally about this, this main character as she walks around her local area, her suburb, streets that she's very familiar with, as well as some places that she's not familiar with, a lot of like exploring and just discovering little things that she hadn't ever found or realized before, and seeing them in a light that brings sort of the absurdity out of the mundane. It's very, um, like a lot of the actual events in this book are very surrealist and would never actually be things that would happen in real life, but I feel like the themes of it or the feeling of it are very, very uh, relatable and reminiscent of when you are in like a place that 
at a time, like even if it's a familiar place, if you're there at a time that you're not usually there, it can be a little bit unnerving or a little bit like you just realize things that you've never had about that area before, you discover things. And so with that, we are invited with, on this journey with this character. And Panpania does a really good job of balancing the surreal elements with those incredibly relatable moments of just almost deja vu. I also chose this book um, because it is an alternative manga. It's definitely not something for everyone, but it's if you enjoy something a little uh, unusual, then this is probably worth a look. I was very, very interested and excited when Dempa announced the license for this. It was one that, uh, from their initial licenses, I knew I was going to get right away. Was not disappointed. This is also my um, choice for the letter I in the third bonus for these bonus challenges. But yeah, if anything that I've said about this series sounds interesting, you should definitely give it a look. Um, my, I really enjoyed when uh, our character gets off on the wrong stop from the train and then this feeling of like being stuck there, of no escape, and that sort of panic that can build up even if you know logically, like, I'm just in an unusual area, I there's nothing wrong, nobody's out to get me, I can get just catch the next train or catch a taxi or catch a bus. Like it's it it appeals to that like very innate I think fear of the unknown, although not in like a terrified sense, just in that like uneasy sense of being outside of your usual schedule and your usual habits and behaviors. Really fantastic book. I would highly recommend it for people who enjoy alternative manga. I did think about maybe adding a Gekiga on here as well, but um, I haven't read one and I may do it in the future for this challenge, but as of now, this is my choice for this, um, this number and yeah, it's a really great book. You guys should check it out. Number 15 uh, for these challenges is a non-fiction manga and my choice was volumes one and two or the entirety of the series my solo exchange diary this is the sequel to my lesbian experience with loneliness as you can see it says there right right there um this is by nagita kabi released in english by seven seas and this is a memoir manga about our author's struggles with her life her mental illness um, her work, her family, there's so many aspects to this series and I talked a lot about this in my last, was it my last pickup video or the pickup video before? I don't remember. But when I got this, the second volume of this book, I spoke at length about how this is an incredibly important but very challenging manga and I wouldn't recommend it to everyone because Kabi is very frank, very upfront about a lot of her issues and there's a lot of very, um, very difficult topics that are talked about in this series. Mostly in to do with her mental health. She has very depressive states, very, um, very unruly anxiety. She suffers with uh, eating disorders and self-harm. There's a lot going on in our, our author's mind and that's all just compounded with the success of her first book being My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness. Um, the first volume, and I said this in my, my pickups video, but the first volume was, um, like with all memoir, was an exploration of why this character, this woman, wasn't feeling like she got the attention or the um, satisfaction of human relationships that she thought everybody has. And she, she sort of equated her interest 
in um, like in other women, her sexuality, in this appeal for her mother's love and wanting to be comforted by other women. And so that that book is mainly about her um, on multiple occasions um, hiring a female escort and, you know, obviously using her services in this search for intimacy and and love and all of these sorts of things that she doesn't feel like she she can get herself through her life and uh, she ultimately comes to the conclusion in the first book that a lot of this stems from her family being very broken and very emotionally distant and her mother not caring about her and her family just falling apart and she hadn't really realized this until she sort of got an outside perspective and started worrying about it and started seeing other people you know living their lives and achieving things at the same age that she is it's it's a very challenging book and it's one that I think a is relatable to the dark, tar, ugh, darkest parts of some people's existence. And, and because of that, I don't think it's an easy one to recommend to people because people do struggle with not, maybe not necessarily to the same degree, but people do struggle with a lot of these same things every day. And so it isn't always the most wonderful thing to be like seeing that so blatantly and in such stark detail like with Carby's books. This is a follow-up to that first book as I said and it's interesting because again with memoir y you have to come to a realization there has to be a reason you're telling this story and there has to be a reason why readers would be interested in it and this book is Carby sort of re-examining her first conclusions that she came to at the end of the of lesbian experience with loneliness um because she realizes in the events through this book and in, in the sequel or the second volume of this book uh series that her perception was completely warped and that this distance she felt in her family this loveless relationship really isn't what she she thought and having gone through so much more in these books um, again just she's not in a very good mental state and it's just compounded because of the success of her first book she's hospitalized she can't really function in day-to-day -day life without self-medicating with alcohol like there's a lot of issues that this poor woman has and she realizes through her hospitalization and through um, how her family sort of supports her through all, all of this and how she um, moving back in with her family and and seeing and having some proper discussions with her parents how much she had sort of ignored or disregarded previously and she realizes that her family does love her very genuinely loves her and treasures her and and really wants the best for her and this perception of an uncaring family who can't get like can't wait to get rid of their useless child is not the truth and it's really really well done but again very challenging it's it's hard to get to the end of these books because it's it's a constant struggle for Kabi as it is for most people who are struggling in similar ways it's very hard but ultimately it's a very hopeful ending to this series you always want this woman to be able to do better in her life and to have a happy future that she just so desperately craves for and hopefully with the support of her family and in the the sort of mid uh, of the second soul exchange book she starts reaching out to more f more and more friends and sort of reconnecting with the outside world in order to get out of this completely insular echo chamber of her own mind 
uh, hopefully with support from a larger community of friends and family and people around her, she'll be able to sort of be happier in herself, find some peace, um, hopefully be able to function a little bit easier as an individual. But as I said, it's fantastic, phenomenal. If you want a non-fiction manga to read and you like memoir and you don't mind very challenging topics, this one is a must read. But if you are more sensitive to a lot of these things, then you know, it, you shouldn't force yourself through it because it really, it, it hits hard and there's no pulling punches with this series. But this was a no-brainer for my number 15 uh, non-fiction manga. Wonderful. If, if, yeah, I would recommend this to memoir fans, even if you're not a manga fan. I would recommend it to people who like sort of human drama or human experience stories. Just so long as you know that you're not going to upset your own mental health or your own well-being being presented such um, viscerally honest perspectives like in this and my lesbian experience with loneliness. Challenge 16 is a borrowed manga and I'm just going to show off the first volume of this but I have actually borrowed the pretty much the entirety of the series through my library. I have one or two more volumes to read but um, by the time I post this it will probably have been that I've read them and finished them. Um, and that is Ray Thomas Dawn of the Arcana. This is released by Viz Media and is 13 volumes long. It's a fantasy shoujo about a red-haired princess who is married off to a rival kingdom. Her husband is the second prince. Um, she really dislikes him initially. She takes along her sort of lifelong companion slash servant, I guess, who is a... He's called, he's a Arjun, which is a humanoid race of, of people with animal tendencies or characteristics. They usually have like ears and tails and those sorts of things. And they're also incredibly strong um, and are definitely the second class citizens within this universe. A lot of kingdoms use them as just like servants or uh, like military footmen and you know just giving them the grunt work uh, basically slaves um, without ever really saying the word slaves but it, the sentiment is there um, but she she herself has grown up very much uh, outcast because of her hair being bright red um, it's totally unsuitable for royalty she's basically the shame upon the royal family and so she herself has been a pariah her whole life and so she has she's grabbed onto this affection and care that her Arjun companions have shown her so she's very sympathetic to their plight and now coming into this new kingdom uh, she's also trying to I guess convince the people around her of this same idea that Arjun are people, they deserve their own rights, they deserve to be looked after. Um, but even, you know, in her new kingdom, she's definitely seen as the laughing stock. She's definitely seen as like unroyal. Um, meanwhile, she also has a power which she discovers called the arcana of time in which she's able to see in the future and the past if she sees blood. So she has this the sight, this magical sight of I guess premonition and she's able, she's not really that uh, aware of how it works or where it came from but there are multiple arcana within this series and they're very powerful um, obviously powers that with if you have them um, at your disposal it, it's a huge advantage so the series is definitely an interesting one it focuses on the sort of 
royalty and class system and you know the the division between humans and Arjun and this threat of war between kingdoms and trying to protect the people you care about and of course all of these different powers of arcana and the effect they have on the people around them as well as the user it's really 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 good um this is a series i had wanted to read for a long long time i actually bought the first volume via kindle um probably a year and a half ago and i think i read it but uh, when I saw this in its entirety at my library, I decided to just borrow the entire thing in a couple of different chunks um, and read it just because I remembered enjoying this first volume, but I didn't really remember a huge amount about it, so I wanted to refresh my memory um, and continue on with it. It's really, really interesting. If you like fantasy shoujo, things like Twelve Kingdoms, or Yona of the Dawn, I would highly recommend this one. Um, again, I want to finish this series myself via the library, but I am fairly certain that this will go onto my list of series I want to pick up for my own collection in the future. It's very, very good, and um, there's a lot of elements to it that uh, you can see are fairly typical for this genre, but the way they're done is very interesting. I honestly didn't expect a lot of things that the series did insofar as um, certain events and certain relationships and how things develop that way. It's fairly interesting. It doesn't seem to follow the exact, like, generic... Uh, expectation so yeah it it's been a great little series obviously um, I chose this for a borrowed manga because I am borrowing it from my library I've borrowed a lot of manga from the library but this one I think I wanted to put here because um, as of now it has been like the entirety of the series that I I borrowed and have had on loan for a little while now and just continue to enjoy throughout all the volumes so yeah, check it out if you like fantasy shoujo. It's one that um, I think a lot of people will enjoy. Ray Toma also has another series currently running, The Water Dragon's Bride, something along those lines. I think that's what the name is. I haven't tried that one either. Obviously, it has something to do with like water dragons and I guess more fantasy shoujo um, with probably more... Eastern twist on it? I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you. I have no idea because I haven't read a single page of it. But if you are a fan of that series, you may want to check out this one. It's an earlier work of hers and it is very reminiscent of a lot of really classic shoujo fantasy. 18 is a cyberpunk manga and my choice may be a little bit obvious, uh, but that is Battle Angel Alita. This is another series that I have thanks to the Comixology Humble Bundles. This is from an earlier Humble, Humble Bundle, in fact, and this is the Cyberpunk Classic by Yukito Kishiro. I didn't want to invest in the hardcovers or the box set because I really had no background on this series. I knew of it, but I just never read it up until this point. But I wanted to read this series for uh, preparation for the new film. I have seen the film. I enjoyed it a lot. I only managed to read this first volume uh, before going and I can see why this has stayed within the collective consciousness, especially like Western otaku um, for so long. It's interesting how a series um, like this has persisted uh, so, so much because of just the impact that the manga had. Um, because this, aside from the singular OVA, never got like a full anime adaptation or anything because of the rights being held up over the Hollywood film. It's interesting. I enjoyed this first volume. I am definitely going to continue on with it, mainly because I have the whole series, so why not? Um, 
but yeah, the, cyberpunk isn't something I really read a huge amount of. I mentioned it maybe before, maybe after, because I'm filming these all out of order, um, that I don't really look out for a lot of, um, like, sci-fi type of things, especially ones that involve, like, cyborgs and that. I'm just, I, it gets me a little bit I don't know I just can't get into it that much compared to some other genres that's not to say that I've never liked a sci-fi with those elements but it has to have something more to it and I will say that Alita like with um some other 80s manga that I read recently and will be on this list has um this pulpiness and is very evocative of like what exactly was expected of that era, what has become iconic of that era of, of media. And Alita is just right, perfectly smack dab in there. Um, I did enjoy it. It was very reminiscent of a lot of other things that uh, were existed at the same time. Um, it's, it's very, very good. I also liked the film a lot, although... Um, even from the small parts of this manga that I have read, I, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one adaptation and I think that's a good thing. It's nice to have adaptations that can adapt to work and make it work within the medium that it's, that it's in. Um, but yeah, Battle Angel Alita, I don't really have a huge amount to say because obviously I've only read one volume of it. I do hope to read the rest of it this year. Um, and it was good. It, I'm sure a lot of people are reading the box set or the hard covers and enjoying it, and I can definitely see why. Challenge number 19 is a manga set in space, and my choice for this that I read in these first three months is Apo Sims by Sotomu Nihei. This is the first volume, which I borrowed from my library. I am also hoping to stay up to date with this series thanks to the Crunchyroll manga app. This is one that they are similar publishing, but the first, I think it's only the second, it's the second and third chapters are not on Crunchyroll, but they are contained in this book, which is why I decided to borrow this so I can just continue straight on through with it. Um, I'm not hugely familiar with Satomu Nihei's work. I've read uh, one volume of Knights of Sindonia. I've read a little bit of Blam. This is the first um, book that, or the first series of his that I'm actively following. Mainly due to convenience than anything else. If you're not familiar with Satomu Nihei's work, he usually writes very dystopic sort of space uh, series. It's de most of his stuff is very much more a focus on atmosphere and setting rather than character arcs and, and characters themselves, which is in, not something that I actively search out. I think it's a very valid way to tell a story, but it's not really what I normally look for in media. I, I really do enjoy like very strong characters. This series is set on a sort of a planet um, settlement on a planet called Aposims, and it's a f far future. Humanity has sort of fallen, and there's a new type of like, I guess, cyborg that is a robotic frame, but it ha also has this organic, uh, they call it a placenta, so an organic body that can change and morph to like battle gear and that sort of thing. Um, there are still humans around in human settlements, but the ones who do still exist are sort of um, very small groups that are basically fighting for their lives and only a few um a few people are at least in this book I haven't really caught up with it yet um a few people of these cyborgs obviously initially started as human and there there's like a governing force that consists of these people I don't know it's 
all very uh, technical and a little bit complicated. This is not a genre that I read very often, as you can probably tell. Um, science, like very weird science fiction like this is not always my cup of tea. I have a lot of difficulty really getting into sci-fi, um, especially when it is very like focused on this type of setting or just, I don't know, it, it's something about it. I have, it's just not my favorite type of thing, which is again, probably why I haven't actively gone out looking for Satomu Nihei's work prior to this. I will say this is an interesting series. Oh, so anyway, we have our main character. His settlement or group was attacked. He was the sole survivor and uh, they had met a... But they found a, I guess, remnants of this girl robotic thing. And since he survived, he's now like somehow fused with the body or that she had. And now he's a cyborg and has this like placenta and all this grand power. And I don't know. It's it's weird. Um, yeah, it's not something I actively sort of look out for. But it's it's nice to like try this type of thing as it is. Um, because it is on Crunchyroll, I will catch up to it. There's think 30 chapters or something on Crunchyroll so far so I have quite a bit to get to but because it is on there like I don't feel bad about you know keeping up to date with it a chapter a month or however or often it comes out I don't know I don't ask me I will say that for a Nihei manga, it's interesting that this... Because Nihei stuff, his his settings um, are incredibly, like, heavy and dark and focused on machinery and pipes and, like, this very man-made environment. And usually it's quite dark, like, very heavy on the blacks and the shading and it's just this mass of, of this monolithic... Um, almost oppressive, oppressive uh, setting. This series, in sort of the flip to that, it's incredibly like white and, and a lot of empty space. And I think this sort of just highlights the, the isolation, like the isolated feel and the starkness of the setting and how alone our character feels, especially later on in this book. It's just emphasizing, um, almost in the same way that like an Antarctic summer is just pure white constantly, um, or it's daytime, 24 hours a day in summer in the Arctic poles. So this just has a very, like, it very much feels like that, this this emptiness, this this coldness, this bright, just enveloping everything. And and it's a very effective. I will give Nihei credit, he is incredibly good at what he does. Um because as I said, in his series it's more so a showcasing of these settings rather than necessarily the events within the books themselves. It's an experience as a reader in exploring these areas that these characters are also exploring. And it's the atmosphere is just done very, very well. So, yes, even though this book is not my thing, I definitely will continue on with this series. It might not be immediately, <laughs> but I do hope to catch up to it sometime near in the future. And, of course, this was my obvious choice for a manga set in space because, well, that's exactly what it is. Number 21 is a contemporary or a slice of life manga. My choice that I read is Konohana Kitan by Sakuya Amano. This is obviously, as you can see, a Tokyo pop release and this is one of their newest licenses. I think this first volume came out mid-2018. 
so it's fairly new and this is a story about a inn that is run by a bunch of foxes it exists within the border of like the actual world and the godly realm and it it's a very episodic series uh, each chapter basically focuses on either a guest and their sort of story and why they're at this inn or one of the you know the girls running it one of these foxes i don't think i've made any secret as to my feelings on tokyo pop both in the past and currently i really don't like the fact that they seem to have popped up again but i don't inherently want them to fail and this is i believe their first uh, new series that they announced licensed when they announced their you know coming back this um Futoyo Baya, i think um hanger which is a bl manga and of course aria which the new volume or the re-release of that series has just started this month so they have a couple titles um in the works this one i obviously heard that they licensed it but it really didn't seem like something I'd be super into it's very moe very fluffy um very like obviously slice of life and despite my interest in a lot of like yokai type stories this sort of thing doesn't really appeal to me it's also very shoujo eye um in sort of the truest sense of that work it, that word it's not really a yuri but it it has enough like yuri-ish elements to completely hand wave them like it, it definitely fills that slot of like almost yuri manga but not really committing to it if that makes sense um which is very like i feel that's a very old type of way of like within the market of of yuri manga and like female relationships as it were um i feel like that type of shoujo i was a lot more not necessarily popular but a lot more easy to find and was being much more uh, widely published in the mid early to mid 2000s because at that time the market route hadn't gotten to this point where it is now where yuri is like a very viable market sector um so it was sort of like dipping the toe in but not really committing to it if that makes sense and this feels like a series from that era which was when tokyo pop was sort of dominating the market so i think it's it's very reminiscent of like an older tokyo pop title i can't when reading this i really didn't want like when it was announced i didn't really have any interest as i said but i saw it at my library and thought well i should give it a shot um you know i'm can't hurt i'm borrowing it out for free there's there's no better deal than that and i for the most part liked it i didn't love it i know i knew going in that i wasn't probably going to love it and that that's why i didn't really have an interest into looking into it and i knew i wasn't going to buy it so if my library has more of this i'll you know borrow it when i can but overall it was sort of just a middling series for me it is very cute like it has a lot of very cute fox girls i liked the chapter with the aging girl in that and i also liked the story the chapter about the little boy who continues to cross over into the inn without realizing that was probably my favorite chapter in this book and it actually surprised me in how much uh i didn't expect it and also how effective it was so if you have this book in your library maybe read that for just that one chapter because that was actually pretty well done um yeah as i said this is very very slice of life very light and fluffy and episodic and very much like the daily lives of these these inn owners 
which is not a bad thing. It does exactly what it promises it will. Um, but for me, not, not really something I'm super duper into. But as I said, I probably will continue to follow this if my library continues to get more volumes of it. And um, yeah, as long as it stays fairly inoffensive like it is now, I'll probably stick to it. A digital only or digital first manga. I've already shown off a bunch of digital manga in this video, but uh, this one I decided to put here mainly because I couldn't really fit it in any other of the challenges, but I wanted to talk about it anyway because it's very, very good. This is another Manga Plus uh, series, and this is another one that has the entirety of the series available. Uh, again, only like 10 or so chapters, and that is Curtains Up, I'm Off by Akitaka Imakoshi. This is a series about a high school boy who is very self-conscious and very nervous and very shy, but um, after sort of his uh, perceived failures at social interaction, he often uh, takes up someone else's personality and replays the situation like, oh, if I was like this, I'd be able to talk to people normally. Um, he, another boy in his class, because he recently transferred to a new school, a boy in his class finds him doing this and sort of blackmails him into joining the, the uh, drama club. Uh, as a stand-in for or as a replacement for one of their actors who also just recently transferred um, and is no longer there. And so from this he sort of gains a love of, of acting and the stage and learns he has a pretty innate talent at it. I really like stories like this so when I heard about this series or when I read the synopsis I was like I'm gonna try that one and I was not disappointed. It reminds me a lot of like Bisco Hattori's found family series that things like Oron High School Host Club as well as behind the scenes where someone it, it reminds me more of behind the scenes than Oron but it's about it with a boy sort of like an outcast not really very confident gaining confidence thanks to the people around him and learning that he has a lot to offer and that he has some talent and has this confidence but he doesn't really know how to tap into it inherently and I really like stories that have like the drama club aspect. I was never in drama club in high school because everyone else who was in drama club was a mean person um, <laughs> and also I just never had any like after school time either. I just, I didn't have time for extracurriculars at all when I was in high school. So I was very, um, outside of this whole, um, community in actuality, but I really like reading stories about the arts and about drama and acting and that sort of thing. Because I, before high school, I did a lot of, uh, you know, uh, performance art and acting and stage uh, stage stuff, um, but not in any sort of larger capacity as I go got older. But it's really, really wonderful. I really liked this series a lot. Interestingly and uh, a positive for me is that our main character, the rival in this series, is a girl. Um, so I liked that they didn't really have any sort of gender division because acting isn't a inherently divided uh, thing in regards to gender. So it's very, very good. If that sounds interesting, I would encourage you to check it out. As I said, it's only 10 chapters long. I think this is another one that comes out every two weeks. So a little bit faster than some of the other series on this platform. I would also say that the art style in this is very like middle of the road. There's nothing great about it. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but you, I wouldn't read this story for the art style, if that makes sense. And for me, that's not a problem. I always like like character stories and plot more so than how pretty artwork looks. Um, but it is like, I guess, more of a generic thing than a lot of other manga. And so that may annoy people. 
I must say also that <laughs> I really want to see the, sh the play that they're doing. It sounds really interesting. So yeah, I mean, that's just a positive for this series because if you can get me interested in a play that doesn't actually exist, that it's doing something right. Launch number 25 is a manga that's been translated into English, but the title is the same as the Japanese. Um, and my choice for this that I read this month, actually, was Ne Ne Ne, by, written by Shiz Shizuku Totono and art by Daisuke Hagiwara. Daisuke Hagiwara, I'm familiar with her art thanks to Horemiya, and I did actually know about this series because of that fact. Uh, this is one of the few Yen Press titles that they simulpub via you know, digital releases on like Comixology and Kindle. Um, and so when they announced it, it was one that I was interested in. I did want to give it a shot, um, but I, I heard that it was only going to be short, so I wanted to wait until the entirety of it came out. And then by the time I sort of got around to it, it's obviously now been put in print. It also has like a collected digital print release as well. Um, cause I wasn't really interested in buying like chapter by chapter as it was coming out. Uh, but this is a story about a young bride who has been married off to her husband who is 20 years older than her. But in saying that he is also a innocent, innocent young man <laughs> at heart. Uh, he's, he's very inexperienced. Both of them are sort of, uh, at this awkward, like never been in love before stage and they care about each other, but they just don't know quite where, where they stand with each other and the limits there are. It's, it's a, the whole series is like these two basically dancing around each other without necessarily having a proper discussion about their relationship. Um, and the, the innocent sort of inexperienced personality is what they try to p use in the series to justify the fact that her husband is so much older than her, but you know, guys, it's not creepy. We promise. Uh, which I'm not exactly that convinced by. I don't inherently dislike manga, romance manga with an age gap, but I will say that it's not my favorite thing. Um, I That's one of the th reasons I don't really follow The Ancient Magus's Bride is that aspect to it, um, which always made me like a little bit uncomfortable. But in saying that, like, a bride story I have no problem with. And there's other manga as well that have you know, relationships with large age gaps that I don't inherently, like, hate. But it has to be written well. And I applaud the attempts at trying to write this. And I d won't say that this isn't effective in portraying these characters as, like, well-suited or sort of on the same page as it were, but the story itself seems like there's a lot of potential that was missed. And as a single volume, it doesn't really culminate too much, if that makes sense. Um, there's a supernatural element to this manga. As you can see, our main male character wears a mask and he does that constantly throughout the manga. I don't understand why that needed to be a thing in this manga, aside from the fact that I guess either the author or the writer wanted our main male character to wear a mask throughout the entirety of the series, or draw him with a mask, um, because the supernatural element really doesn't play into this story whatsoever. They There is one chapter where they hatch a baby dragon or something, um, but that that animal, that pet, could so easily be switched with like an actual pet, whether that be a cat or a dog or whatever. It just seems like an unnecessary element to this manga. And perhaps it was to add a little bit more dimension to the setting, 
but it's not really ever utilized. We never really see anything supernatural happening, and it's never really mentioned outside of the fact like, oh, we have a weird egg, or oh, I have to keep a mask on or else something bad might happen because of stuff. Like, it just doesn't really, I don't know, just doesn't seem like it's needed. Uh, I will also say that I felt like the whole time I was reading the story, it was very much, because of our character's awkward, awkwardness, it felt like you were spinning your wheels a lot. It, it felt like for a six chapter or something volume, it doesn't feel like much happened, which is sad to say. Like, I, I, dis I don't like saying that, but I don't r really remember a huge amount about this manga. And I only read it like a couple of days ago, like last week. For me, I am happy that this was a manga I l borrowed from the library. If I had bought this, I don't think it would stay in my collection because it is unmemorable. And I don't think it's, as it is, I don't think it reaches its potential. If it was an ongoing story, I'd be willing to like continue with it. But right now, it just feels like a story that had some ideas but was cut short. And ultimately, because of that, there's not a huge amount in this book to be offered that other manga can't give you in a better way. Uh, and that, I don't want to be like harsh, and I know a lot of people really liked this manga. They thought it was adorable and wonderful and very cute. And it is adorable and cute and wonderful, but for me, like, it just doesn't have much to keep me interested in it. So, yeah, the, obviously the, the reason I chose this one is ne 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 is the, is the title in Japanese, also in English, obviously, you can see it right there. Um, I am happy that I read this. It is one that I'd wanted to read for a long time. I'm just a little let down that it wasn't more. And there's a series that I'm going to talk about sort of later that has, I, I think, maybe some similar descriptors to it, but I enjoyed a lot more. And I'm not quite sure what that series did um, that this one didn't that made me enjoy it more, other than maybe like a, a more solid plot line to follow and more of a conflict. I don't know. Maybe that's what this series needed. More conflict, less puttering about, oh no, what will he think or what will sh she think? And I can't do this because, oh no. I don't know. It just seemed like frustrating. <laughs> Challenge number 26. Um, I said that there was one... Um, exception to a series that I start would ha had to start this year on this list and this is my choice. So number 26 is a character with a disability, a manga featuring a character with a disability and my choice is Perfect World by Rei Aroga. This is volume 8, the most recent one, the most recent one I read. This is a phenomenal Jose manga about a woman and a man who were sort of peers and friends in high school who reunite after several years and our main character discover like the girl she discovers that this boy that she's been friends with and has had a crush on since high school or during high school not since high school um has suffered a uh, in a horrible accident and now can no longer walk so he is in a wheelchair and it's really, really great. I really encourage people to read this one. I like that this, although it has obviously aspects of a physical disability, it never shies away from the reality of it. It's not a gimmick in so far as um, like, oh, he's in a wheelchair. He can't walk. Now she'll heal him with love. Like it's not that. It 
it does show like a v- the very real struggles and the very unfortunate fact that a lot of modern society and a lot of able-bodied people don't really realize the amount of things that are difficult or can go wrong for people who have disabilities like this just their body shutting down on them because they can't feel you know certain things happening to them it's really wonderful phenomenal if you like jose manga if you like romance manga this is a must read um i would encourage you to pick it up especially obviously if you don't mind digital releases and it has some of the most painful cliffhangers in manga that i read it's it is uh hard to wait between volumes as i said volume eight is is the most recent one and again a big cliffhanger so i'm waiting for volume nine to come out soon this has a german uh published release so i'm very very jealous of that i'm hoping that we may see this in english i don't know i don't necessarily count on it but this is one that if it did get announced for a print release i would i wouldn't mind paying for it again i'm absolutely double dipping but yeah, obviously I chose this for a character or a manga featuring a character with a disability because our main male protagonist is, but we also have numerous other characters who are wheelchair bound and who have uh, physical disabilities. Really, really great, wonderful manga. Check it out. Story 27 is a manga with a f- transforming character and my choice for this category is Yoko Nogiri's That Wolf Boy Is Mine. This is a four volume shoujo manga released by Kodansha and it is completed in English. I read this book or these the series through my library and I really enjoyed it. It was very fun and sweet. If you're not familiar with this story it's about a girl who After some trouble at high school and after her mother having to move due to work, she decides to go live with her father, who obviously her parents are divorced, so she goes to live with her father up in Hokkaido and sort of give herself a fresh start, sort of reinvent herself. Once she does, um, joining her class, she sits next to this boy who is very um he's very good looking but he's also very friendly and he quickly sort of attaches himself to her wants to be friends but she quickly learns that he's definitely mr popular he and his friends are regarded as the princes in their school and so they're very sort of untouchable they have this distance between them and the rest of the students that un- incredibly she sort of has already broken down this this wall between them and and other people one morning she discovers uh this boy ogami who is sleeping outside um and actually just sees that he has a tail and some ears and she passes out um and she she discovers that all of these boys all of these pretty boys are actually animals with the power to transform and have sort of integrated themselves into human society mainly for the food and entertainment but also as a way to enter local government and be able to protect their mountain life their habitat as it were So our main character, Ogami, he is a wolf. He's actually half wolf um, and has the, uh, obviously the power to transform to and from a human to a wolf. His friends, um, one of them is a fox. So uh, within folklore, it's very common for foxes to be able to transform into whatever they wish to be, usually people, and then cause a ruckus. They, we also have a tanuki, which similarly, they, it, within folklore, generally have this ability to transform and to have disguises. And then the third and final of his friends is a cat, um, a two-tailed cat, which generally is a house cat who has been loved and has lived so long that they've gained magical powers. 
and all of their personalities sort of reflect the animal that they are. Although she discovered their secret, they do try to hypnotize her or to get rid of her memory, but unfortunately they're not able to, and they're not quite sure why that their magical powers of hypnosis or memory erasure isn't working. So they sort of have to just deal with the fact that this girl knows what who they are and what they are and trust her despite their general distaste of humans anyway. It's a really interesting fun little series. As I said only four volumes long so not a huge commitment but it is you know if you're a fan of shoujo and romance and a little bit of supernatural twist this is definitely one to check out. I had heard some pretty good things about this series but I never really commit myself to to seeking it out and the fact that it was at my library definitely helped me to pick this series up or to read the entirety of the series and it was very good. I would yeah definitely recommend it for fans of shoujo if you haven't tried this one out yet. It's very good and obviously I chose it for category 27 because not only our main male protagonist but all of his friends as well as their teacher can all transform from their animal you know versions of themselves to the hot boy versions of themselves and there may be a little bit of a twist as well at the ending too so there's a lot of transforming characters in this series and it I think definitely is worthy of the spot on this challenge. 28 is a manga that features siblings and my choice is the is another digital manga on Manga Plus and that is The Sign of Abyss by Maya Takamura. This is an ongoing fantasy series about a prince who has the magical uh, a magical ability um, basically the sign of abyss in which uh, if he uses his magic, anything gets sucked into this like abyssal area and is destroyed. In his childhood, he accidentally used it and then destroyed a town. And since then, has been lit uh, like living as a pariah. He's been banished basically, but because he is a prince, one of the several princes and princesses of the royal family he couldn't be executed or anything. One day he meets a girl whom he calls Meme who he discovers is the like the mimetic um, which is she sort of chronicles uh, the royal history and the history of their country and she has lived in solitude this whole time and they've become friends and since like meeting her and like a lot of different events, um, he's slowly becoming um, more so the prince that he is and taking responsibility and being able to use his magic without being afraid of it. This is a really great series that I wasn't necessarily sure of initially. There's a lot of world building in this series that isn't inherently explained. Um, it took me to probably about chapter 10 and there's currently like 30 something chapters out now. Uh, to really get this manga um, because there's not a lot of exposition. They sort of just throw you in there and and you start swimming or you start drowning. But in saying that at chapter 35 or whatever it is now it's really really good. I really like this one and I chose this for a manga that features siblings because currently and I think a lot of the focus I don't know because this one is quite unpredictable. Certain things get achieved much earlier in the storyline than I would expect. So usually um, manga like to have a larger goal for the end of it and but this one has sort of like short smaller short time goals although they're not necessarily small goals if that makes sense. Um, but I chose this one because currently in the manga the focus is on a fight for inheritance or fight for the crown between the multiple siblings um, of the king or not of the multiple children of the king the multiple siblings of this prince uh, he is the youngest prince the sixth prince but there's nine uh, nine of the kids all together I think he's also the youngest full stop like just the youngest kid um, 
So yeah, there's a lot going on in this manga. If you like fantasy, if you like series that feature magic, um, I would definitely encourage you to try this one. I think, as I said, at about chapter 10 or 15, it's when it really hits its stride and when I really got engaged into it. It was good up until that point, but I was still like, what is going on? I don't know if I missed something or what, but yeah, really great series, although a little bit hard to get into, but now it's just absolutely flying and I cannot uh, recommend it enough. Category 30 is a manga featuring characters with superpowers and my choice for this that I read obviously was Tokyo ESP by Hajime Segawa. This is another library series that I borrowed in its entirety. It's eight volumes or 16 single volumes and two in one editions by Vertical and is obviously completely available right now in English so you can buy it or read it if you want it. This series I chose for this because of this, it's framed as ESP powers, but um, our main character, Rinko, she discovers one morning that she has the ability to phase through objects and phase through things. Um, and through an explanation from one of her uh, peers at school, who also has a unusual power to be able to... Um, teleport from one spot to another is that she has been I guess engifted with this weird power thanks to a unusual uh, ghostly or translucent fish that was in the sky which she had been following the night before she was actually following the flying penguin that was chasing them and uh got caught up and obviously had a fish go inside of her and now she has this weird power. She is not the only one. There has been multiple individuals over the last three months who have developed weird powers thanks to these fish, including her own father, who has a weird uh, mag magnet type uh, power that attracts items to him. Um, there's a lot of different characters, both good and bad, and it's very much set up like a Vigilante Heroes series. Um, there is definitely a mystery element to this series insofar as like, who's responsible for this? Why are they doing this? How can we stop them doing this? And um, there, a lot of these questions are related to this boy um, from Rinko school that who was the one to like tell her all about it and who is very has his heart set on being this vigilante hero for justice it's an interesting one I wouldn't say it's my favorite series of all time but it's very quirky there's a lot of imagination here and there's a lot of character growth and development over the course of the series a lot of characters change and their motivations, you know, adjust to the situation. It's interesting. As a whole, the art is pretty solid. There are some points where I think there's some major issues, especially like characters and profile don't always look very, in like, I don't know what's wrong. They look a bit weird. There's a <laughs> elementary school character in this series who looks like an adult who's just been shrunken down. I don't know, the proportions of her just seem really weird comparatively to everyone else. It just looks like, I don't know, it just looks weird. Um, but that's not to say, that doesn't really impact this manga a huge amount. Another weird oddity about this series insofar as, I guess, translation quality is that Rinko, our main character, is very often in the media described as a white girl or the white girl. Not in the Caucasian sense, obviously, but in so far as her white hair. Well, maybe in the Caucasian sense because her mother is a foreigner, so we don't know. But um, it's very obviously because of her white hair and it's a little bit jarring when you're reading it, that that's the turn of phrase that the translator decided to use. And I understand that that's probably a one-to-one -one direct 
translation to what is used in the manga in Japanese, but it feels like there was probably a less awkward way to phrase that、um, when translating to English. Because every time I read it, it is a little bit. Like, it does throw me out of the story a little bit. So, yes, just something to keep in mind. But overall, it's a pretty interesting series. If you like series with super powered characters, this is one to check out. I also want to say before I forget, this is my letter T choice for the bonus challenge three of finding the alphabet. Obviously, because the series starts with a T. Um, but Tokyo SP is interesting. Not my favorite that I've read, but as I said, if you like pretty interesting, solid, super powered action series with a mystery and a lot of variety in characters and powers, maybe check it out. 31 is a manga with an animal companion, and my choice is Altair, a record of battles by Kotono Kato. This is a shonen manga set in the Turkish Empire where I guess it's like a general, he's a young, young guy,、um, but he is stripped of his rank after making a, a decision that goes against sort of what he was instructed to do. And now is sort of traveling around the empire, seeing if he can regain his position, if he can,、um, you know, re- be, a better, be a better individual than he was once. He was,、uh, he, as he is very young, he was quite cocky, being sort of the youngest general、uh, appointed or whatever. This, this is a manga I was fairly interested in when I heard about it and when Kandansha first licensed it. But、um, the first volume, I don't know what my expectations were. It didn't really, it was a lot more different than I had expected. It's without the fantastical elements, it reminds me a lot more of something like Magi rather than something like A Bride Story. And I think I was more expecting that. I don't know why.、Um, but after sort of realizing that, volume two and three, which is what I've read up to, were a lot more enjoyable. I really like this sort of setting and this idea of like the Turkish Empire and all of this.、Um, I chose this one for this prompt or for this challenge because our main character has a hawk as a companion who he fights with and travels with and does everything with、um, his loyal bird friend. And It's really, really well done. I really like some of the spreads in this. As you can tell, the artwork is beautiful, very detailed.、Um, I hope to get the art book for this one sometime soon in the future. I don't know when that'll happen, but it, is, it will happen, I promise.、Uh, this is another series that I got via the Humble Bundle,、uh, thanks to Kadansha's you know, partnership with them. And so I have the first nine volumes available to read. I think there's maybe ten on Kindle. I'm not sure, don't quote me.、Uh, but this is an ongoing shonen manga. It's an action、um, currently.、Uh, yeah, it's sort of like a Yona or a Magi where they travel around and help people immediately, like within that situation. Although, unlike those two series, it doesn't have this magical, fantastical element to it. That doesn't mean it's not. It's not good.、Uh, it reminds me of Heroic Legend of Arslan as well.、Uh, so that's probably a better comparison because that doesn't have magic in it.、Um, very, very interesting, good, like fantasy,、oh, fantasy historical action series of a setting that we're not always that used to in manga. So check it out if you haven't. Although I would say give it a couple volumes to really hit its stride. 32, a manga featuring gods or monsters, and my choice is Hell's Paradise Jigoku Roku by Yuji Kaku. This is a really, really great,、uh, I don't really know how to explain this series. It's about a ninja criminal who、um, cannot be executed. He, his ninja like, ability is making his body like, unkillable, basically. Um, and after multiple failed executions, he is offered a second chance of being able to like, live his life and have his crimes wiped free or whatever if he is able to retrieve sort of this elixir of youth、um, 
And he, it's a sort of battle royale-esque type of setup where there's a bunch of other um, criminals who are being offered this. Um, and they also, each criminal has a handler who are, um, in, come from a specific school of like katana and, and are incredibly gifted. And his, his partner or his handler is the head of the family. And she's sort of not that confident, but this guy, we learn that the reason he was even captured in the first place and imprisoned was because he was trying to leave his ninja group and live a peaceful life with his wife. So he's, he's definitely trying to, um, you know, succeed in order to live happily with the person he loves the most. I chose this one for this prompt because they are on this island trying to, or in this area, trying to get this this youth, uh, I guess, serum or whatever. And there are a bunch of really weird monsters that are very obviously, you're not sure whether they're gods or monsters. That's the whole point because obviously this elixir of youth, um, it's called Hell's Paradise because it's no person who's ever gone there has made it out back alive which is why they're sending criminals and you're not sure whether these monsters are actually gods or demons or they're just designed to look like buddhist gods it's very very interesting and it, read the first chapter uh, this again this is another manga plus series that has the entirety of the series available i've only read up to chapter 10 but chapter 50 just came out so there's a lot more to read um, if chapter one doesn't grab your attention, then this is not the series for you. But that first chapter is so good and it's just continued to be good. Um, I would recommend it. It's got a lot of obviously like violence and fighting and that sort of thing. And a lot of like weird body horror stuff as well. So maybe don't try it if you're not into that. But if you are, definitely check this one out. And again on Manga Plus, pretty much available for everyone. 33 is a manga featuring a female main character. Uh, again, a lot of the manga that I've talked about in this video can is applicable to this, but my choice is another Manga Plus manga, and that is Soloist in the Cage. This is a currently a 10 chapter series, uh, sort of fight, or it's a thriller series, um, action, uh, by Shiro Moria and it's about a young woman who she grew up with her baby brother in this town the city that is basically a prison so but I you're not quite sure whether her parents were killed or whether she and her baby brother were abandoned um, but she was only able to survive thanks to the kindness of the men living in the apartment opposite to her up until then she had never left the apartment that she grew up in. They were very much isolated and separate from the rest of the world. And um, when these men next door are, are planning to escape, they offer to take this girl and his, her baby brother with her, with them. Um, during the escape, there's a problem and she ultimately is separated from her the the baby from her brother and has had to abandon him and so now it's like 10 years later she's grown up and she's hoping to find him and rescue him she's returning to the place that she had she had escaped and hoping to reunite with the only family that she had um, and to protect him like she couldn't in the past it's really wonderful um, again like quite dark and as I said a thriller there's a lot of various um, thing, things that are implied with this manga but not necessarily shown. At only 10 chapters oh, it's obviously got a long way to go I would expect story-wise but it's really really good and one that I would encourage you to uh, check out. Number 35 is a manga that is set outside of Japan. This is also my choice for the bonus uh, letter M and that is Memoirs of Amorous Gentlemen by Moyoko Ano. This is a manga set in France, I think Paris, about a woman who becomes an escort or a prostitute um, in order to monetarily support her lover. 
and sort of the everyday lives of the women in this, uh, you know, bordello, as it were. Um, it's very, very interesting. I love Moyoko Ano's works. If you're a fan of Jose, I would definitely recommend you try this one out. I will say that it is incredibly mature because obviously dealing with uh, sort of a job of this nature, there's a lot of female nudity, a lot of like very sexual and sort of kinky situations. Um, but in saying that, it's very, very good. And I think Moyoko Ano really writes very complicated human relationships very well. Um, beautiful series. This is one that has been simulpubbed on Crunchyroll for years now, but it was on hiatus for a long time. And it's just recently come off of hiatus. I believe chapter 16 is the final one. So this series is actually over. I hope to see the last two chapters sooner rather than later. I think, I think it's all done. Um, and yeah, so I hadn't, I didn't actually start to read it until recently when it came off of hiatus. Um, and I'm glad that I waited because I could read it all in one hit and it's very good. I would love to see a print release of this if we ever, you know, were deemed worthy enough <laughs> but up until then or if you're wanting to read it now and you have a Crunchyroll premium membership or if you're a fan of Moyokano check this one out it is all right there for you to read. Adjusting the camera for number um, 36 a manga I've owned for over a year this is also my choice for the letter A in the bonus um, third bonus and that is Akira, the box set, this is Katsuhiro Otomo's sort of dystopic future sci-fi series about a sort of ESP powers. This is an 80s manga. I bought the, the 35 year anniversary box set that Kurancha put out. Beautiful hardcover releases unflipped for the first time. Um, comes with an art book and all of that. But I hadn't actually read it until January of this year, which is sort of weird timing because if you're not familiar with Akira, it actually, uh, the, the events of the story happen over the years 2019 and 2020. So it's like, this is weird timing for me because I didn't realize that and it just sort of was a big coincidence. But this is about a, the leader of a gang of motorcycle sort of delinquents uh he and some of his of his friends sort of run into some major trouble and uh he Kanada, the main character he sort of realizes that there's something going on he runs into uh this very old elderly looking child who has esp powers um or well esp so uh, sort of psychic powers and he learns of this sort of governmental conspiracy plot of these children with ESP and how if one of them is awakened the titular Akira the the immensity of his power will basically cause the destruction of the earth there's weird prophecies and a religious group and a lot of very over-the-top action sequences and terrorist groups trying to stop things or start things. Like with a lot of 80s media, not just Japanese, it is very like just pulpy action fun. This sort of is the quintessential popcorn type of series. It's very good. I really enjoyed it. Um, obviously Akira is a classic. It's one that is just so evocative within pop culture. Everybody can recognize sort of the logo and the motorcycle and the jacket. It's just there's so much of Akira that is referenced in so much other things that it's sort of impossible to be completely unaware of it. Uh, but in saying that, as I said, I hadn't actually read it until this box set and until the beginning of this year, just because I bought it and I really wanted to get to it, but 
obviously I just never did and I bought this box set right when it came out so this was 2017 so it's been about 18 months since uh since the release of this so obviously a manga I've owned for over a year and I'm happy that I was finally able to get to it in the collection because it's been it's been lurking there and I've been waiting for sort of the right moment um yeah fantastic even if you don't want to buy this the incredibly fancy and expensive hardcover editions the flipped normal versions that Kadansha have put out for years and years and years are still readily available this is one that I don't necessarily think everyone needs to have in their collection but I do think it's well worth the read for everyone especially people who like this type of setting or if you're just like a classic manga fan it's one that will appeal to a lot of people and it is very very good it, it sort of has stood the test of time insofar as that it's not um it is very much like media of that era it's it's definitely within the wheelhouse of what was popular at that point but there's enough to it that makes it just really interesting really appealing and I can see why it's persisted as a classic for so so long but yeah Akira I don't really need to convince anyone to read it although I've spent the last five minutes talking about it it's a wonderful series and I was happy to finally get around to it in January of this year. Number 37 is a manga older than you and my choice is another library loan and that is Unico by Osamu Tezuka. Obviously this is the collected release and this is the Kickstarter full color release of this manga. It is flipped. Um, I believe this is the first run, the fir like the first Kickstarter release of this manga that DMP put out and if you're not familiar with what Unico is it's a shoujo manga by obviously Osamu Tezuka people regard it as the grandfather of manga as it were and Unico is the story of a young unicorn who is banished through time and space because of the happiness and luck that he brings to his owner and so uh, the the god Venus becomes incredibly jealous she banishes him and so far that he remembers nothing about where he was who he is what he can do where he's from the only thing he remembers is his name and so this this is an interesting story this <laughs> I'm going to sound like a really bad manga fan when I admit this, but this is the first Tezuka work that I've read. Um, not for lack of interest. There's a lot of Tezuka manga that I'd like to try, but this is the first that I've read. It's not the first Tezuka manga or Tezuka story that I've, um, you know, enjoyed or... or um, been involved with. I enjoy Pluto, which is obviously adapted from an Astro Boy story. I enjoy the Metropolis film. I've seen various iterations of Blackjack and uh, something else that I can't remember. There's, there, you know, Tezuka is sort of hard to miss <laughs> as it is and obviously incredibly influential. But up until now, I hadn't ever had the opportunity to read one of his manga. Uh, this book is very episodic. Each chapter is self-contained and it's about Unico wakes up, discovers like he doesn't know who, who he is or where he, where he is. He befriends someone and because of the luck and magic of unicorns, uh, usually brings happiness to their lives. And when he's shown unconditional love, um, love without expectations, he's able to perform magic for that person. Um, each chapter is uh, self-contained, obviously, and at the end he usually uh, helps 
save the day or, or saves the situation, and then unfortunately is ripped from the people he, who care about him, and he finds himself in the next chapter waking up with no idea who he is, but searching for this, this uh, care and this love in his life. It's, it's interesting. Um, I wouldn't say every chapter is wonderful. Some are definitely better than others. But it, ultimately, it's a very sad manga. It's the idea of being so alone and isolated and not knowing where you are and ser seeking out that um, you know, unconditional love is something that is not really explored a huge amount anymore in manga and in saying that this that whole aspect this whole story Unico itself was discussed in a series that I mentioned earlier in this video My Solo Exchange Diary which is very much what Nagito Kabi ha Nagito Kabi has has been looking for and and her own struggles with this emotion and I think Unico appeals to that idea of of searching for for people who care about you that don't expect anything more than the, your own care in return. It's it's interesting. Um, in saying that, this is a manga that is much older than me. It was serialized between 1976 and 1979, so almost uh, 20 years older than me. Um, this is a full colored release. It is also flipped. So I, I think I mentioned that before. Um, there's a lot of, like, this feels like a weird one because a lot of, there's a lot of fourth wall breaking in which, um, characters directly talk about, like, this being a manga or, um, things like that. Characters also talk about manga and anime and various pop culture things a lot, despite supposed to be in like a period where manga would not have existed um the characters would have no knowledge of it there's no way they could have had knowledge about it but that's obviously like that's just being fun and I don't really hold that against it there are so many pink lady references in this manga there's like five uh, which was a band dur like during the 70s a girl a I guess a, a girl's band. I don't know, but they, there is a lot of references. I'm like, what? Why do you keep referencing this band? I mean, obviously because young girls were probably aware of it and were like, yeah, I love Pink Lady too. But I don't. I, it just seems weird. <laughs> um, the last, the final chapter in this book. This book, as I said, is a weird one because it's, it's episodic. It's a very, like, heavy subject matter, despite being about, like, this cute little unicorn. Um, and, of course, it is... A lot of the stories focus on, like, romantic love, but also family love and things like that as well. Just the search for love and the different types of love in general. The, this is not a happy book. This is not... A feel-good book either um, ultimately the last chapter in this manga Unico sent so far um, from anyone so far back in time and space that he he ends up in completely alone and the only person he meets is the the demon of solitude um, and, and it's obviously like it's a struggle to try and connect to this literal demon of solitude in which they have spent their whole life alone and that's what's expected of them. And they go through all of these things and they become friends and then, uh, spoilers for a 40 year old monk or 50 year old manga, um, the Zephyrus, the, the goddess who has been taking him to all of these places, comes and takes him back, be, takes Unico back because she says, you know, this is the saddest thing and I, I, I can't do this and even the goddess like feels bad, so we're taking you somewhere else. But 
This is after he's befriended this demon of solitude, and thus this demon, after learning what friendship is, is left all alone again. That's the saddest thing I've ever heard. Oh my god, it's really sad. And maybe that's ultimately the point of this manga, of, of you know, sometimes you search so much for people who care about you, who love you, but sometimes solitude is all you find. And, you know, not everybody gets a happy ending. It's, it's, mm, um, yeah, Unico I knew wasn't, like, sunshine and rainbows and, like, happy times, but I wasn't expecting that ending, <laughs> I gotta say. Uh, it's, it's interesting one. As my first Tezuka manga, it's probably a fairly good starting point. I can understand why this was the first one that was kick-started. I can see why people wanted this story to be in print so badly. Um, if I had more experience with Tezuka manga, would I say this is, like, my favorite? I don't know, because I really don't have any point of reference. I don't think so, but I do think that Unico is, is an interesting series. It definitely has its place, and it's one that I do think that people should try and should experience because it's it just shows how much manga has always been able to do it it shows what shoujo manga has always been able to do and what has always it has always been about um yeah really interesting little book and I'm glad that I read it although it did make me, like, very sad at the end. Uh, Unico is a manga much older than me, but still one that I would say is definitely worth a read, especially if you're a Tezuka fan, but even if you're not, if you have an interest in, like, manga of this period or older shoujo manga like this one, uh, definitely give it a shot. 38 is a manga by two or more authors, um, and my choice for this was Clover by Clamp. This is another manga that I borrowed from the library, and honestly, I believe this is maybe my first, I, possibly my second manga by Clamp that I've ever read. I know, it's a travesty. I don't really follow Clamp's work all that closely. I have seen anime adaptations of a lot of their series, um, but overall I find a lot of their work, obviously because it's sort of set within this giant multiverse of Clamp titles and everything's crossed over with everything else, um, a little bit too overwhelming for me to get into properly. I have the same issue with like the Type Moon stuff, so Fate Stay Night and all of those series, as well as um, other similar like multiverse type stories. Um, Clover is an interesting one. This is the 4-in-1 Omnibus Edition by Dark Horse, and although this, like this is a library copy so it's very beaten up, it still is a beautiful release. I can see why people really do love these Dark Horse re-releases of this series. I'm sure that the Kodansha re-release of um, Cardcapture Sakura is also going to be wonderful. This story, I... Story-wise is a little bit... Mm, just very all over the place for me. But... It's not so much that it was hard to understand. I just feel like maybe I'm missing something <laughs> because, as I said, I don't really follow a huge amount of Clamps' works. Um, it is very beautiful. The paneling, the character design, just the delicacy of it is very much uh, what I would expect of Clamp, and I have always thought that Clamp has a wonderful way of 
doing their artwork, of their how a page is set out, just their layouts and their spreads and all of that is gorgeous. It's just their stories that can sometimes be just too much, too overwhelming. If you're not familiar with Clover, it's a story about, um, I guess, this future um, where this society in which individuals are born with certain powers and the level of their power um, is graded. And so they have this thing called the Clover Project and depending on your power level, your gain, like you get an extra clover leaf. And so our main character, Sue, is the only four-leafed clover in existence. She is the most powerful. Um, even the five wizards or whatever can, don't have enough power. So if she wanted to, you know, go berserk and sort of create a problem, then they really didn't have the power to stop her. And so she's been relegated her entire life um, purposefully and by her own choice as well to this life of solitude. But over her her existence, she has she develops this friendship with a singer who she heard over the sound waves of life because that's one of her powers. She can hear everything that's ever been said. And just fell in love with this woman's music and called her and created this friendship with her. And through her, uh, sort of fell in love with the singer's boyfriend, the man she loves. Um, so our story starts with her meeting this man and being him being given this, uh, I guess order to take this girl, Sue, to the, the place she wants to go. Um, there's a lot of, like, there is a lot of characters in here. We also meet some of the three-leafed clovers. The, th the entirety of the final volume within this four-volume series is dedicated to the three-leaf clovers, which I find interesting. Um, they're a pair of brothers, and there was a third one, um, I don't know if he was a brother to them, but there was a third one, and he's dead now because of jealousy. Uh, there's just a lot of interesting things. You never really know, like, how much power these these young kids have, like, what type of things they can do, aside from they're just all-powerful, and if they tried to do something, then... I'll, they generally couldn't be stopped. We also have an insight on the one-leaf clovers and the two-leaf clovers as well. It's interesting. There's a lot of aspects to it that, as I said, are fairly incomprehensible, but I feel like that's just the way that some clamp manga is. And as I said, I feel like maybe this has a lot of relation to other things that I haven't read, which is my problem rather than this series's problem. Overall, I found the story, the overall story, fairly interesting in regards to the Clover Project, but I found this manga a little bit repetitive in because of it. There's a huge emphasis on songs and music and lyrics, and so there's a lot of, like, repetition of song lyrics and songs throughout the entirety of the book uh, or the entirety of the series especially the first three volumes and it's just a little bit like you feel like you're skimming over those bits because it just okay like I get it okay it's just it's just it's used in it for emphasis but it's again a little bit too overbearing and I feel like there could have been a better way to have to do that. I don't know. I didn't love this story. I think I'm still fairly set on my personal preferences when it comes to clamp stuff. Um, I, I'm always willing to try manga and I'm always willing to try 
the works of artists and Clamp obviously are an incredibly popular and influential group. I will never take that away from them. I I really respect them as, you know, uh, this group of creators. I chose this for this uh, certain category because uh, I'm sure everyone knows this, but Clamp is a group of women who have been creating manga of all sorts of types from all s sorts of demographics for a huge amount of time. Um, their body of work is just, it's almost astounding. Um, there's five members, I believe, in Clamp and they have everything from like very dark drama, action dramas to like very weird, um, sort of shonen -y supernatural stuff to very cutesy shoujo stuff. A lot of their works are very iconic, things like Cardcaptor Sakura and um, Holic and Tsubasa and I have seen the anime of, of Holic and Tsubasa, I've seen a little bit of Kobito, I've seen um, some of their OVAs, Chobits is one of their hugely popular uh, seinen manga, um, and X obviously is incredibly popular as well, although in, in on indefinite hiatus. Um, there's a lot of, like, Clamp has so much, and I've tried certain parts of it, but I've never had really seen the appeal and never had the personality to want to jump into like everything that they've created. Um, as I said, I'm always willing to read more from uh, creators and Clo I'm happy that I read Clover. It is beautiful. It's done very interestingly and uniquely, but I find it a little bit tedious <laughs> and a little bit just too esoteric for me. I feel like I'm outside of the loop. I'm not in on the inside joke, um, if that makes sense. I don't know. It just feels like clamp works are a very hard place to know where to start. Where is a suitable starting point? Maybe it's with Cardcaptor Sakura, maybe it's with something like Holic. I'm not sure. Um, but I do want to read Holic. I want to read um, X. I want to read Cardcaptor Sakura. But I don't think I'll ever really own Clamps' works, which is why I'm happy that my library seems to have so many of them. Um, but yes, it, Clover is fine. It's probably fairly standard for a clamp manga. I don't know. I'm not an expert on this. And as far as this challenge went, I'm happy that I actually ma was able to read a clamp series in its entirety. And now I have. And I'm glad, you know, that I've had this experience. But I'm probably never going to read this again. Number 40 is a manga with a number in the title, and so my choice for this was Pen Dance by Inoue Sato. This is a BL manga about two professional dancers who want to compete in the Ten Dance, which is an event where you have to um, dance five different dances of two very distinct styles, standard, ballroom, and then Latin. Um, each dancer it specializes and is incredibly uh, gifted and accomplished dancers within one of those styles. So they decide to sort of team up with their partners as well to teach each other sort of the basics and uh, their, you know, their dance to help each other out as it were. And obviously, although it doesn't really happen in this book, you do, well, it does, like, the romantic element hasn't really built in this book, but you do see a relationship forming between these two male dancers who, up until this point, were very much uh, rivals. The Latin dancer really disliked this. The standard dancer, he found him quite pompous and sort of full of himself. Um, and you can slowly see their relationship shifting. It's very, very good. 
uh, a BL manga that I had been recommended endlessly, even before it had been licensed. So the fact that Kodansha has licensed it is just a plus for me. It's really, really good. It has some wonderful character interactions. I love the female characters in this as well. I always like it when BL has female characters, whether they be friends or family or whatever else. I like it when BL and Yuri as well have like the opposite gender because, I don't know, it just feels weird when there's only guys or only girls existing within the universe um, of the, the manga. And with ballroom dance, like obviously a partner is so important and so crucial <laughs> to the sport. Like you have to have a, a dance partner, otherwise it's not it's not a dance, or at least not a, a comp competitive uh, partner dance like Latin and like standard ballroom is. It's done really, really well, very funny at points, and I really like the personalities of everyone. If you're wanting a good BL, like a good current BL, this is absolutely like one I would highly recommend. Um, the second volume has just come out. I'm waiting for my copy to arrive to me so I can read it and enjoy it and tell you all about it in my pickup video. But it's just wonderful. Um, yeah, obviously I chose this one because, well, it's got 10 right there in the title. And it is one that I think um, maybe a few people know about but maybe don't necessarily know if they'd like it or not. Um, I think it's good to be a little bit critical about certain genres. Um, I certainly certainly am but this series if you're a BL fan it gets a big thumbs up for me. It does have a more of a slow burn relationship so if you're wanting something like extremely explicit right off the bat this ain't it but uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed. It's done really wonderfully and I cannot wait to see where this story goes in the future. Number 42 is a manga that's been recommended to you and my choice for this was the three volume series After Hours by Yuta Nishio. This is a Yuri manga about two women who meet at a club and sort of fall into a relationship and sort of how that you know, works over their lives. We have the younger one who's really not sure what she wants to do. She doesn't really have a job. She's not in a comfortable position with her boyfriend. She's really unsure about her life and where to go from here. And she meets this woman who just seems to have all of the answers. She seems like she's living this dream life, um, this, this life that uh, our other character would never really um, consider for herself and it's just so new and exciting and she meets so many people and she's learning so many more things. The third volume um, is way way thicker than the first two but it's really it's a story that builds up it breaks down that idea that ideas of like the perfect life and people being totally having their life figured out and struggling in relationships and this perception of like what do you value what do you want to hold on to and what you know what's important for you to keep in your life it's very very good this series was recommended to me by a lot of people the one that immediately comes to mind is Bass Jolaer and she adores this series and I can definitely see why uh, this one was recommended to me a lot because it is a Yuri that features two adult women who are not in high school, who are, well, one of them's working, but, you know, they're of the age where they'd have regular jobs, they have regular lives. It's really refreshing and it's something I complain about a lot in regards to Yuri manga because comparatively, like BL, you get, you do have a lot of adult characters, you have a lot of different settings, a lot of different backgrounds and setups where Yuri you don't usually get that. It's usually high school girls meeting and falling in love and it's high school and everything's hunky-dory. Um, 
but yes, After Hours, a lot of people recommended it to me because it seemed to fit right into my wheelhouse of things I want and sort of hope to see more of in uh, in Yuri manga and I was not disappointed. Thank you everybody who recommended me this and I have been getting recommendations for it since this first volume came out. I only bought the entire series very recently because I wanted to wait until the entire thing was out and I did order it all at once but every time I got a, a new volume it would take forever to get to me uh, so I didn't get the third volume until very recently uh, whereas the first two I got in pretty quick succession but anyway that doesn't matter nobody cares about that it's <laughs> it's a really good series if you like Yuri manga I'm sure you've already read it but if you haven't uh, definitely give it a look because as I said it has some really great characters um, a very relatable situation and it does break down this idea of like a perfect relationship and this idea of people having all the answers and really like the manic pixie dream girl ideal as well it just flips that on its head it's it's very very good and I liked it a lot and I liked how it ended and I just I liked it a lot so yes it was a recommendation to me for a very long time and now it can be a rec recommendation from me uh, to try it if you haven't because it's it's really great next is a genre you never read this is number 43 of the challenges my you know choice was Dementia 21 by Shintaro Kago who is a very well-known Eroguro artist this is not an Eroguro work but um, it does have a lot of elements of like body horror and just very overtly like weird stuff going on uh, which is not something that I actively seek out. Um, I don't think I'd be necessarily be able to enjoy a lot of his other works that are already available in English, um, a lot of which are Eroguro stuff. Um, but this one was okay and I did like it and it's it's an interesting one because it's about a, a woman who is a carer. She helps the elderly, uh, looks after them and it sort of plays directly to sort of this innate weirdness or almost fear of the elderly that us humans and our monkey brains have. Um, because we're like old people can be weird sometimes unfortunately thanks to just this perception of like loss of facilities and loss of mental clarity and all of these sorts of things um, and Kago really captures that well with this manga I think there's a lot of like with a lot of manga like some very ridiculous things over the top things that would never ever happen but the way it's presented you almost do believe like yeah I could see that happening or oh no yeah that's that seems about right um it, even s when you're pushing it so far as like it's very, it's built off of very mundane things that people tend to uh, associate with the elderly, things like not being able to drive, things like being just angry at younger people, at obviously needing help, that's why they have a carer, and all of these things being twisted into this like very horrifying, weird weird situation and this poor carer it sort of has to escape each and every one of them because the reason she keeps getting into these problems is because she's incredibly accomplished and it's made a lot of people at her workplace very jealous so they keep sending her to the problem the problem clients and it's very episodic each is self-contained there's no real overarching plot line you're just following the same woman in lots of different houses with lots of different old people and it's just an experience uh, as I said it's not something I actively search out but I did enjoy this series for what it was um, but yeah I don't necessarily think I'll be seeking out any 
of the other Calgo works currently available just because it's really not my thing. Um, but for what this is and sort of the level of what you expect from Calgo, this is this is good. And if you're a cargo fan, you probably already own this. Um, but if you like sort of body horror and like just really bizarre, weird things, uh, sort of in the same vein as something like Junji Ito, like it's, it is quite horrifying. Um, but this is comedic as well. It's not just pure horror. I would probably say you should check it out because it's very good. Um, but yeah, not exactly the a genre that I actively uh, seek out. Number 44 is a new to you author and this was a new to me author although I have talked about one of their other manga that I read later in these first three months um, and this is also my choice for the letter C in the bonus, the third bonus and that is Cross Managed by Kaito so obviously I already spoke about Blue Flag. This is an earlier work of theirs that's a shonen sports manga about a high school boy who after an injury can no longer play soccer uh, but he befri he meets and befriends a girl from uh, one of his classes or from the same grade as him in school who loves lacrosse um, but she doesn't really know anything about it. She doesn't have a coach and she's trying to establish a girls lacrosse team at their school. So through some cajoling, he becomes their manager slash coach uh, for the girls lacrosse team at their school. And it's really very wonderful. I like the fact that it's a shonen manga focusing on a women's team. I liked the fact that it was, although it is, um, a sh like it does have a lot of the tropes and expectations of a sports manga, it definitely pushed some things in unexpected directions, but that's not to say that they didn't have a lot of quintessential parts of sports manga, things like a rival team, training, teamwork, building. Um, I really liked all of the different girls on the team. They all had some really wonderful and different personalities and motivations. And being five volumes long, it's very focused on just like a short term goal, but kind of a mo major goal for these girls who really didn't have any direction up until this point, at least in regards to the sports team. Um, but that doesn't take away from the series. It obviously doesn't have such a huge reach or, or goal or expectations as something like Q or Slam Dunk because it is a, it's only five volumes long. It's not a huge amount of chapters, um, but it is one that I would think a lot of people would like if you gave it a shot. It is only available digitally on the Shonen Jump app or Kindle if you buy the volumes. Um, but it's really, really good. I hope to read more of Kaito's manga because both of them that I've read have been wonderful and I look forward to reading more. It's one, uh, this and Blue Flag are just much different than I expected and I, it makes me excited for other series by Kaito. Next is number 45, which is a collection of short stories. And the one that I read for this manga challenge was Town of Evening Calm. Country of Cherry Blossoms by Fumio Kono, whom you may be familiar with her work in this corner of the world. This is like with that story about um, the people of Hiroshima, and this story focuses a lot on sort of the aftermath of Hiroshima rather than the lead up to it. Um, and so it focuses on like sort of like the survivors and generations of survivors. Um, the, you know, the people who were born from survivors. It's very interesting. Uh, the, the title itself is the name of the two separate short stories in this book, a very skinny book again. So we have Town of Evening Calm, and then we have a part one and a part two for Country of Cherry Blossoms. They're both very beautiful, very wonderful, um, human stories about obviously a very, tragic event in human history and just devastating within Japanese history. And you can definitely tell that Kono has a real affinity to the setting, to the people and the city and what happened there. Uh, she really wants to tell the stories of, of the Hiroshima people. And 
it's interesting. Um, this is a pretty hard book to find nowadays. It's not readily available. I think both this and the hardcover edition are out of print. So um, it's not one I can actively uh, recommend you go search out. But if you find it, if you're a fan of sort of, sort of short stories and again, um, like very human emotional drama type stories, and and retellings um, and within historical fiction as well. This is probably one to look out for, especially if you liked In This Corner of the World. It's a little bit more, because they're short stories, they're a little bit more focused, um, a little less lackadaisical and slice of lifey than that book was. So if you didn't like that aspect of, of In This Corner of the World, then you may enjoy this one more. The first short story, Town of Evening Calm, is about a young woman who is uh, a survivor of Hiroshima and it's been several, several years later and sort of how it's, the effects are still echoing within the people who, although not killed in the blast or immediately afterwards, are still being affected every single day. Um, you also see in Country of Cherry Blossoms this generations, like two generations, one or two generations afterwards of, um, of people who were born from survivors who didn't, don't really understand living with the stigma of being a survivor because unfortunately that was something that was very, very prevalent uh, following the bombings. Um, and the slow shift in society and, and perception of these people in this event, it's very good. Uh, I can't really emphasize that enough, but this isn't one that I can say is super easy to find. Maybe if your library has it, check it out. Or if you, as I said, you find it for a decent price and any of the things that I have explained about it seem appealing to you, then you should probably give it a shot. Number 47 is the first volume uh, released in 2019, uh, the first volume of a series released in 2019. This is a little bit of a cheat because this is a, a single volume manga. I don't think there's going to be any more, or at least as of now, there's no more. But this is a manga that came out in 2019, and that is Beauty and the Beast Girl uh, by Neji. This is a Yuri manga about a monster girl and a blind girl and their friendship, how they meet. Uh, they meet in the forest, and because obviously one of them is blind, um, this monster girl has an opportunity to make a friend for the first time, and they're they're personal journeys of slowly falling in love. Now, I mentioned with Nenene that there's a series that have similar elements or similar uh, praises um, and explanations for it that uh, I did enjoy comparatively to that, and this is that series. Um, I think the major difference between this and that, although they're both very sweet and soft and just really cute uh, relationships is that this does have a larger plot line focus to it. We, with the series, we learn sort of how this girl, other girl, lost her sight, and the relationship of the Beast Girl that to that event, um, and sort of the because of her blindness, her her family's protectiveness, and her relationship with her mother and her father and sort of the guilt that this beast girl has and this idea of taking responsibility even if it hurts you. It has, yeah, even though it is a very sweet and lovely sort of first love story of two very similar people coming together, this has more of, more guts to it. Than Nene, and I don't. I'm not. I don't want to bring up Nene because I don't. I that's a fine series, but it's like a six for me. Where this is like closer to an eight point five, maybe a nine in just execution and enjoyment. 
it's just really really lovely i did complain a little bit that i think the beast girl could be more beastly uh she can definitely have more beast-like features without losing her appeal in my opinion um but yeah this came out in january of january or february of this year so it's a very new release i know a lot of people have already picked it up if you like yuri manga if you like sort of unusual yuri manga and you like the soft fluffy type of yuri manga with a bit more bite to it this is definitely one to check out it's one that like with nanana and i hate to bring it up and i hate to compare but this one is another one where i feel like it has a lot of potential for more and Neji has mentioned that they may write more on Pixiv and, you know, develop these characters a little bit more. And if I saw another volume of it, I'd be happy to read it. I'd be very happy to read it. So, yeah, Beauty and the Beast Girl, really interesting little... It's a one-and-done type deal, but uh, for a one-shot, it, it packs a lot more of a punch than I expected from this little book. Number 50 is to catch up or f finish a series and my choice is Dr. Stone. I actually have one more chapter to read but when I filled this in that I was completely caught up and this is an ongoing shonen I guess action manga about um, current day people something some large event happened and the entirety of humanity was petrified in stone and it has been 3,700 years since our main character has emerged from the petrification along with his friend and a few others to this modern stone age as it were this future stone age um, and now they're trying to re-establish society um, and all of the conveniences of, of society in order to survive and to re-establish the world as it was I really like this manga insofar as I appreciate the fact that it it presents science in a really fun and interesting way and with a lot of respect to obviously the kids who are reading this and with a lot of reference to things that they'd be very familiar with, things like television, the smartphones and bread and all of these sorts of things. I like it when educational stuff can be entertaining. I do not like <laughs> a lot of the female character designs in this series mainly because they just have very scarily um, designed bodies just for the sake of fan service. I'm like, oh no, all of your bones would break. You should be in intensive care. That's not sexy. That just looks like you're missing ribs. Um, but that, you know, that's a me thing compared to probably the majority audience. As someone with a science major, major, I appreciate that all of the science is accurate. There is a lot of reference to um, you know things that do exist and there's you can tell that they have an advisor on certain aspects it's a it's a solid series I like how it you know it it goes it doesn't necessarily develop in ways you expect it's really good and I'm sure a lot of people are enjoying it it's not one that I was ever planning on buying um, which is why I don't pick up the volumes but being able to read it on Shonen Jump on the app um, has made my life so much easier and again it's it's well worth the read especially if you like this type of thing or if you like science or if you just you know like this idea of this premise check it out whether that be via the books or digitally or through your library or whatever um, but it's not like a must-have for me for my collection that being said I can see why it's very popular in Shonen Jump although Again, I'm very worried about some of these girls running around with waists thinner than their necks. Um, yeah, but again, that's a me problem and not a necessarily a problem with this series itself. 51 is a comic from outside of Japan and my choice was the US comic, Bloom. So obviously published in English. This is written by Kevin Panetta and Savannah. Uh, illustrated by Savannah Ganusho, whom I follow on Twitter. I will link her Twitter in the description actually because she's great and more people should follow her. She's a wonderful artist, um, although fair warning she does 
do a lot of fan art for things like Yuri on Ice. So if that's not your thing, sorry. But she's an incredibly talented artist. Um, this story is about... It's a teen drama romance about two boys. I say teen. Um, the, the younger one who... And I've talked about this as well in my pickups video and sort of elsewhere. But... Um, this was highly recommended to me by some mutual friends and um, I was already watching out for it anyway because as I said I follow the artist on Twitter and this is a story about the son of a baker who wants to sort of get out of his one horse town, he wants to make a name for himself, go to the city with his band and just live an independent life and sort of discover himself. And then we have this other boy who's coming from university during the break to settle his grandmother's affairs after her death, trying to sell her house and just get everything in order. And from removing himself from the city and finding um, sort of this tranquility in this small seaside town, he, he rediscovers himself. He tries to, to rediscover who he is and what he cares about. And this story is about their friendship. Um, obviously, uh, this the story starts by the college student applying for a job at the bakery uh, during his time in this town, uh, training to replace the baker's son in case he does leave um, as a replacement. And their friendship that grows through that and sort of they're falling in love from that proximity as well. And, and discovering like what is important to you and the people who are important to you and it, just that difficult time transitionary period where you're young and you've got so much ahead of you but sometimes that blinds you to the, the people and the places around you that care about you and that should be important to you and that value you as a person more so than you as like what you can be or what, who you wish you could be. It's so beautifully done. The art is magnificent. I showed it off in my pickups video. Um, it's blue, uh, very like blue toned, similar to this cover and just superb um, just absolutely wonderful heartwarming heartbreaking lovely little story about this very confusing period in people's lives and yeah the the complex emotions of falling in love and trying to find yourself and growing up and the mistakes you make and the mistakes that other people make and that um, you know, when you should be forgiven and how, what you have to do to be able to prove to not only yourself, but to the people around you that, you know, you do deserve to be forgiven. There's a lot in here. It's very, very good. And it was well deserving of the hype and the accolades that I was exposed to in the lead up. If you're looking for a wonderful little, uh, first love, or I don't even know first love, but like teen drama romance, this is something to look for. Uh, first, first, second books or this publisher are wonderful. I love so many of their books. One of my favorite from the year before last, or was it last year, uh, was the Prince and the Dressmaker, which is wonderful. That's such a good book too. Um, I don't talk about like my more normal comics as it were, uh, very much in my collection, but I'm hoping to remedy that. And this is, has been the first that I've absolutely gushed about. So it's really good. Read it. That was everything. Oh my goodness, it was a long one. I apologize. I did say it would be long. Um, I knew that I would talk a lot about certain things and I hope that maybe this made you guys aware of some series that you hadn't heard of before. I did want to sort of focus, I mean I've read a lot of manga recently and I'm probably not going to read that amount in the future because I don't have as much free time thanks to uni and work and all of that starting up again. Um, 
But I did want to focus a lot on the digital manga that I read because I talk a lot about the stuff that I buy in print but not necessarily the stuff I read digitally and I do read quite a bit obviously as you can see from this list. And I think it's really nice to have digital options. I know people do think that you know print is better and I don't inherently disagree with that but I do think that there are it's a lot more convenient to have digital releases I think as like with me I don't want to buy everything that I'm reading so it's good to be able to read in on a legal app like with Crunchyroll or Manga Plus or uh, the Shonen Jump app manga fans have so many options nowadays and I don't I don't like to not talk about really good series just because they're digital only. I want to encourage people to try things, even if they're not necessarily in a format that you're super comfortable with or that you prefer, because a lot of these series do deserve to be read, um, and just because they're not in print doesn't mean you should skip over them. And the only way to so ensure a, or to encourage a print release is to show that there's interest in the digital release because numbers matter for these things. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like to hear that but it is it's true it's important and yeah so thank you guys so so much for watching I'm not going to spend too much longer on this ending because I've been speaking for far too long. Um, as always you can Get my Twitter uh, link in the description as well as my book depository link that's also there. I hope to